Good afternoon and welcome to the first uh, Riga conference coffee break conversation. Uh, this afternoon we'll be discussing uh, NATO on the way to a new identity. Uh, my name is Julian uh, Lindley French and I have the distinct honour of uh, welcoming an old uh, friend and colleague, Ambassador Alexander Verschbau, former United States Ambassador uh, to Moscow, former uh, NATO Deputy Secretary General and distinguished fellow of the Atlantic Council. There are, there are four issues that uh, Sandy and I are going to address in this session. Russia, China, uh, the 360 degree alliance and the forthcoming NATO mini summit in, uh, in London. So let's get on with, uh, with, with the main questions. Sandy, the Russian threat is, is evolving and here of all places, they're conscious of that, they understand the need to hold firm in the face of the Russian threat. What is your assessment of that threat mm -hmm. and uh, how is NATO doing? Well, it's, first of all, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be able to talk to uh, our viewers uh, during the Riga conference, which is interesting as always. I would say that, uh, yes, the Russian threat is evolving, but the basic challenge that we face here in the Baltic states hasn't changed dramatically since uh, the watershed year of 2014 mm -hmm. when the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, their kind of uh, rejection of the whole uh, idea of partnership with the West uh, became our new strategic reality. Uh, and uh, you know, the challenge is to deter the Russians from carrying out aggression, either direct or using their uh, nefarious uh, hybrid to toolkit. Uh, I think the, the, the main challenge that we think about here in the Baltic states is not sort of large-scale aggression, which we have to be prepared for that, but that would presumably give us a fair amount of warning. Uh, but what we m worry most about is some kind of short warning uh, land grab that could be uh, based on the Russians' geographic advantage, the sizable forces they have in being, as well as their ability to rapidly mobilize a lot of forces, uh, and their ability to use little green men and cyber attacks and other things together with yeah. conventional forces to present NATO with a, a fait accompli before we could uh, generate the forces to, uh, and bring in the reinforcements that would be needed to, uh, to, to, to beat them back. Uh, they, they might hope in such a scenario to paralyze NATO decision making and basically so to present us with a fait accompli before we even uh, are able to start uh, responding. So this is a serious challenge, and of course NATO is a, an alliance based on consensus, so it's inevitable that decisions can't be taken uh, in, in real time in some circumstances, particularly if what's happening is ambiguous. Yeah. But I think NATO has done a lot uh, since uh, 2014 uh, to counter and deter the, even this kind of nefarious scenario. Uh, there were two especially important summits, uh, the one in Wales right in the, the crucial year of 2014, and I think the Warsaw Summit in 2016 is where the most crucial decisions were taken to, to rebuild NATO's deterrence posture and, and its deterrence strategy and to set in motion uh, the work that is still going on, but I think has already uh, made NATO less uh, at risk of this kind of uh, uh, short warning uh, threat. The most significant thing we've done, uh, I would say, of all the different uh, initiatives, and there's lots of acronyms, is the VJTF Indeed. and the Enhanced NRF and all that. The, the, by that I mean the Very High Readiness Joint Task Force and the Enhanced NATO Response Force. Uh, but the most important thing was EFP, the Enhanced Forward Presence, uh, whereby NATO deployed uh, battalion-sized battle groups in the three Baltic states and in Poland uh, to provide forces in place that would show the Russians that even if they tried to sneak in with one of these hybrid attacks, they would encounter forces from the whole alliance and not just local forces. And uh, you know, they would be, in a sense, walking into a war with the entire NATO alliance. Uh, and I think that, in and of itself, was a game changer. And I think the Russians recognized that, but, uh, but we still can't uh, count on them being always uh, entirely rational actors. Uh, as I said, this is work that is ongoing. It's going to take several years. There's been some newer initiatives in the last few years which are also very important, and I would highlight one, one other one, which is the NATO Readiness Initiative. Indeed. Uh, known as the 430s, where NATO commits to having four ground battalions, four uh, um, ships, and four uh, air squadrons ready on 30 days' notice uh, to ensure that not only the, uh, th these battle groups that are already there, but reinforcements could come in you know, much faster than is possible today. 
so this is uh, being implemented uh, even as we speak. Uh, hopefully uh, all the pledges of the forces and the commitment to raise forces to the high level of readiness will be in place by the end of this year. But are you confident that, that, that politically the alliance is resilient enough? Uh, the nature of a contemporary attack, how would we know it's an attack? Would you get that consensus at the, in the NAC to respond at the kind of speed and responsiveness that, that one would require? Well, I can't say uh, with 100% certainty, but I think NATO is uh, improving its ability to uh, reduce, reduce the uncertainty uh, and, and hopefully the Russians will see that we are able to do that. One thing NATO has done, uh, which I think is very important, is to strengthen its overall intelligence capabilities, uh, raising the uh, importance of this in terms of the, the, the bureaucracy, but most importantly, improving the actual sharing of, of, uh, of intelligence within the alliance. But we've also, th based on the experience from uh, simulations and exercises, uh, ensured that the commanders have at least some uh, authority delegated to them in advance. Yes. yes so that at least the preparation of forces, the staging of these reinforcements could begin, even if the Na NATO Council in Brussels is still debating exactly what's going on, and there will be inevitably uh, some who say, let's go slow, let's not escalate, and others who say, you know, the sky is falling. So hopefully there'll be enough space for the decision-making process, aided by improved intelligence and uh, c confidence that the commanders aren't just sitting waiting for the signal to, to start moving. It strikes me to move on to the, uh, a second issue of China. The two things, that one is we can't ignore the rise of China because of the impact on the United States. And secondly, if the alliance is to function, it has to be a worst case alliance. It's hard to imagine that in an, in an emergency uh, that there would simply be a crisis in Europe alone. There'd probably be a crisis elsewhere that, 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 that uh, engaged American forces in, in some strength. And in some ways, China is Europe's coming power. Mm -hmm. um, how would, should we as an alliance deal with China? Do we have a policy in place to deal with China? Yeah. Well first I would say on a general level you know, the idea that there could be crises in multiple places even if uh, the, the biggest threat we have to worry about is Russian aggression is, is still true and NATO needs to be able to uh, project power mm. to deploy forces uh, far from Europe as we've shown the ability to do in our operation in Afghanistan. But those operations, uh, the, the operation in Afghanistan, you know, gave us a lot of time to prepare. I think we still have ways to go to improve the logistical support that would be needed to move forces more quickly in a, in a kind of fast-breaking crisis far away from Europe. The U.S. has this capability. The rest of the allies, with the exception perhaps of Britain and France, on a small level, not so much. And that's one of the things where the, the sharing of burdens within the, within the alliance has to, uh, has to improve significantly. Indeed. It's, it's not just about spending, although that's important and still a problem, but it's about the uh, ability to deploy forces that Europe is still lagging way behind the United States. Now on China, uh, the, it is looming as NATO's uh, next threat. In fact, it's, it's, it's here. Uh, and, and it's a com more complex and multidimensional threat. Uh, there's a military dimension, although I would say that China is most, uh, uh, at most, a revisionist power in its own neighborhood yeah. where it's yeah. uh, trying to alter realities with these artificial islands and air and bases and its effort to kind of establish uh, hegemony over some of its neighbors. Uh, but China is already becoming a military factor even in NATO's considerations. They have a base in uh, the Horn of Africa in Djibouti. Uh, they, uh, their, their ships are participating, participating in Russian exercises in the Baltic Sea. They're investing a lot in uh, icebreakers and other capabilities to become a dominant power in the Arctic as the uh, possibilities of, uh, of the passage from Asia to Europe increase. Uh, and of course with the uh, program known as the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, as well as the Asia Investment Bank, the Chinese are becoming a factor in competing for influence along NATO's borders in uh, the Middle East, in Central Asia, in North Africa. Uh, so NATO needs to kind of look at the all, uh, at all the dimensions of the Chinese yeah. threat and, and develop a strategy. And I think that is something that I understand is taking place even, uh, even now. Uh, I think this is at least targeted as one of the uh, deliverables for uh, the, uh, the summit that's taking place in London in uh, early December. I don't think they'll have uh, all the pieces of a, of a 
a strategy for the long term, but I, ho I hope that they will decide on some key elements, including uh, developing a mechanism for consulting more systematically on China's different uh, activities and threats yeah. that it poses, yep. uh, looking at, in particular, some of the immediate technological risks that we've already been hearing a lot about with respect to 5G and over-dependence on Chinese uh, technology uh, uh, going forward and you know, recognizing that our military communications use civilian infrastructure, so uh, this is a problem that every nation has to face up to right away. But NATO can set standards and, and define the threat. Uh, and of course, this, this issue of expanding influence uh, is an area where NATO probably needs to work more closely with the European Union and develop some, some kind of uh, answer to the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, maybe our own version, so that uh, these, the countries that are now understandably uh, seduced by uh, cheap credit to build major infrastructure uh, projects will have a different place to turn and not be uh, sort of caught permanently in debt to China or otherwise uh, under China's uh, less than uh, benign influence. Is my language too strong to suggest that China poses a threat to alliance cohesion? Well, that remains to be seen. Uh, I'm hearing positive noises that the Europeans, uh, both in this NATO review that's going on and also in the European Union, where they've yeah. declared China to be a systemic rival, I think was the term, that uh, they're not fighting the problem. They're not doing this just to please the U.S., uh, although the U.S. is pushing very hard, uh, but I think they realize that uh, it's time to kind of get ahead of the curve before uh, the Chinese threat becomes much more immediate. Uh, and uh, that in and of itself is encouraging because there is a head in the sand uh, tendency uh, when new threats emerge. Uh, but I think that uh, we're off to a good start. I mean, in a sense, the, the, the issue of China is where East meets South, and one can understand why the focus in, in, in Latvia is clearly on the East. But we face a substantial challenge to the South of the alliance, and uh, uh, what's happening between the Turks and the Kurds right now, for example, mm -hmm. could have huge implications for the Southern members of, 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 of the alliance. Much is made of the 360-degree mm -hmm. Alliance, one hears the rhetoric all, all the time, but does it actually exist in your view? And how can we both deter in the East the likes of a strategic peer competitor like Russia and engage and secure in the South in the face of an, an incredibly complex, almost generational set of challenges mm -hmm. facing the Middle East and North Africa? Mm -hmm. now that's a, a question NATO has been trying to answer uh, for the last few years. Mm. We always looked to tw 2014 as the watershed year. That was the year that ISIS uh, really emerged and declared its caliphate. And NATO uh, said that it was a 360-degree alliance and that it was going to develop policies to deal with southern challenges and threats, even as it focused heavily on uh, deterrence against the Russians. I would say that this 360-degree NATO is uh, more, s more slogan than uh, substance so far. There have been some... Uh, some achievements. Uh, NATO agreed to develop more programs for defense capacity building with some of the neighbors along the Mediterranean and in, in, uh, in the Middle East to help them improve their ability to both secure their own countries, contain potential radicalization and terrorist threats, and uh, you know, participate in coalition operations uh, in their neighborhood. Uh, and we've done some other things. Uh, we have a maritime operation in support of the EU that's trying to uh, help get a handle on illegal migration. Indeed. Uh, at, at our command in Naples, there's now a thing called the Hub for the South, which is supposed to develop more information and intelligence based on engagement with the, the neighbors as, uh, as opposed to straight intelligence so that we have a bit more of a feel for what's coming and how to, how to deal with the problems and prevent conflicts from emerging. But all of these uh, efforts are kind of uh, modest, uh, to put it diplomatically. There's very little funding that goes into these uh, training programs. Most of it's based on voluntary contributions you know, in the tens of thousands yes. of dollars by nations. Uh, NATO really needs to commit some common funding uh, in, in the mi millions of euros, if not hundreds of millions of euros, so that there's much more of a strategic impact of these different uh, partnership programs. And at the same time, as, as we've seen since the Russian uh, intervention in Syria in 2015, the so-called projecting stability agenda that uh, was adopted in 2014 
isn't enough. Uh, Russia is back with a vengeance in the Eastern Med. They're behaving much more aggressively in the Black Sea. They may be peeling away our ally Turkey uh, with this uh, S-400 decision. Uh, so NATO needs to think about containment and deterrence of the Russian threat uh, in, in uh, the Eastern Med, which may mean uh, additional maritime capabilities, surveillance, intelligence, and reconnaissance capabilities, uh, so that we are able to uh, uh, push back against some of the more aggressive Russian behavior in the region and be prepared for unforeseen contingencies, uh, which are still certainly possible, as we're just seeing in, in, the, in, in the recent days. And how do we cope with Turkey? I mean, Turkey is an important ally. It, it sits at the hinge of the eastern flank and the southern flank. Mm -hmm. uh, there's talk now of, of sanctions because of Turkish action. Uh, at the very least, surely the, the, the bases inside Turkey could be a threat. Uh, how do we engage with Turkey mm -hmm. right now, given its importance and, and given the nature of the regime? Yeah. Well, Turkey has always been a difficult ally, but mm. at, the, at the end of the day, NATO is stronger having Turkey in the alliance and trying to work through these problems when they arise. Uh, this issue of sanctions is, is complex. Uh, I think it's the EU which may, may be doing that, and that's going to complicate life inside NATO mm -hmm. uh, inevitably as well. Uh, but uh, I think we have to uh, work with Turkey inside NATO, but also the United States and the major allies have to, I think, consult more uh, intensively with, with our Turkish allies so that we uh, can at least narrow our differences on how to deal with some of these immediate threats. Otherwise, we're going to see the Turks turning their backs on Europe. They might even follow through on some of these, frankly, irresponsible threats by President Erdogan uh, to sort of open the tap and let yes, three more million refugees flow into Europe. Uh, let's just hope that it doesn't get that bad. Uh, but uh, I think we're seeing, uh, frankly, some of the consequences of of a somewhat indecisive approach to the Syrian conflict from the very beginning. And uh, it hasn't gotten that much better since the Russian intervention. We've ceded too much terrain to Russia, and Turkey is sort of following the intervener who they think is stronger and, and ready to take more decisive action. It's a little late to get back in the game. President Trump, of course, wants to just get out, which uh, uh, may only make it worse. Indeed. Mm -hmm. let, let me conclude with a, a final question about the forthcoming mm -hmm. London mm -hmm. Mini Summit. It's, it's 70 years after the founding of our alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, London will take place against the backdrop of, of, of tensions, not least of, of Brexit. What, from your experience, is the most that we can hope for mm -hmm. from that London meeting? Well, I'm hoping, first of all, that it goes smoothly and that uh, the President uh, of the United States doesn't have uh, one of his uh, well-known tantrums, uh, although he may have a good reason to because the, uh, the issue that he cares most about, uh, defense spending, you know, meeting the 2% goal, is still uh, an area where the progress has been, uh, shall we say, uneven. And uh, there's some big laggards that uh, have not really improved, uh, including Germany for first and foremost, but also Italy, mm -hmm. who doesn't get as much flack, but they, they could do a lot better. So uh, there will be a progress check on uh, how many countries are meeting their pledge to move to 2% of GDP. And that could be uh, a volatile discussion. But I think it's also an opportunity to review some of the positive uh, initiatives that uh, I talked about earlier, uh, particularly this NATO readiness initiative where we hope uh, there could be you know, a declaration that we have achieved the 430s. We are uh, now a much more ready alliance. Uh, another area where uh, there may only be limited progress but needs, needs the spotlight is um, uh, called military mobility. NATO working with the EU needs to do a lot uh, to deal with uh, physical infrastructure gaps that could impede reinforcements, but also legal and procedural uh, bottlenecks that could make it hard to actually bring the reinforcements, even if they exist yes, under, the, under the 430s, to the eastern flank uh, quick enough to, uh, to blunt any, uh, any Russian provocations. Uh, the strategy towards China may be the biggest uh, new development from this summit, and I, uh, I think they are on track to announce uh, at least the beginnings of a China framework. Uh, and uh, I hope that they'll send some kind of signals to Russia. 
uh, maybe firmer signals than we've been hearing from the President of France of late, uh, that until Russia shows a shift in its behavior, particularly in eastern Ukraine where it's been dragging its feet for almost six years on implementing the Minsk agreements, uh, that such a change in behavior is the prerequisite to any steps towards normalizing relations with Russia. There's been so many mixed signals on Russia, I hope this summit can maybe send a single message of alliance unity on uh, the Russian problem. Sandy, Ambassador Bush, Bush Bell, thank you very much indeed. You're very welcome.